languages. Uh, but these men, uh, while they were separated from their original religious traditions, weren't very far removed. And these traditions and religious attitudes seeped into their daily lives in, in certain telling ways. Some books have been written about this. For instance, Freud created a famous collection of small figures that he, if you go to, go to the Freud house in London, they've recreated his study. The couch is there, the famous couch, his desk, his library, and all these little miniature figures that he collected. He spent a great deal of money on these antiques. And he put them, he lined them up on his desk. And he spent a lot of time with them. But they weren't just works of art for him. There are stories that when he was writing, and he would write late in the evenings after a long day of practice and having smoked 20 cigars or so and <laughs> been to the coffee house and read the newspapers, he'd go home 10 or 11 o'clock at night and start writing. And as he wrote, he would hold one of these figures in his hand. And he communicated with them. And when he was in the middle of a creative project, he would take these figures to the dinner table with him and wouldn't speak to the family members. He would carry on his conversations with these figures. So people have speculated, what were these figures to them? Why did he do this? What did they mean? He was doing what we would call active imagination with these figures. And they spoke back to them and they inspired him. It was a way of opening his mind to the creative, to the unconscious, to a different way of thinking that was also rooted in ancient forms and patterns. That's exactly what Jung did as well out in Bollingen. He would meditate and, and think his thoughts and, and uh, experience his, uh, his uh, creative unconscious, uh, sometimes carving stone figures. In his library in Zurich, uh, there's a small room, his consulting room, and at some point, I think in the 1920s or so, he was able to purchase the stained glass windows from a church in Germany that was being torn down, and he had them installed in his library. So to his left, the left of his desk, he has these religious images. In front of his desk, hidden by a screen, uh, that he would occasionally lift up, he had the Shroud of Turin. And uh, so he surrounded himself by religious imagery. On the other hand, in his library, he had the bust of one of his heroes. And uh, his grandson told me one day, he, he, uh, he had this bust in there, and, and people asked him, where did he get this? And he said, well, he bought it in Paris when he was a student. What was it? It was a bust of Voltaire, oh. the hero of the Enlightenment, the uh, anti-clerical uh, philosopher. And so there was this side of Jung. Jung also was a man of the Enlightenment. Uh, he was rational. He had an empirical, scientific approach to his work. Uh, and although Freud called him a mystic at the end of their relationship, it's unclear what Freud meant by that, because I think Freud also was a mystic in his own way. Um, well, Jung did go on, and uh, I'm not going to say too much about it, to explore what we could call the religious nature of the unconscious. And he wrote up some of these cases in in a, in a number of works. Um, he claimed that he discovered a process in the unconscious that could be compared to uh, a spiritual development. And if you follow the dreams and you follow the fantasy life of someone who's deeply engaged in, an, in this process of individuation, you can put it beside a a uh, process of spiritual development similar to what the Jesuits go through in their spiritual exercises. And in some of his lectures in the 1930s, he gave, uh, he gave talks about the, the comparison, similarities and differences. Or you can put them beside the development of people who practice Kundalini Yoga. He gave some seminars in the 30s on Kundalini Yoga and Western 
uh, individuation process, and the developments that he could find in his delvings into the unconscious. And so he was very interested in what he called the religious problematic that appears in the analytic process of secular Western people who don't set out to engage in a spiritual development, but as they go deeply into their process and into their unconscious and unearth their dreams and work with them, uh, turns out that religious issues come up and they appear uh, quite by surprise in, in very scientifically oriented secular people.